This is the lecture for de Beauvoir's Moral Idealism and Political Realism. The, uh, you don't need to know anything before you read this, so this lecture is entirely optional and you can watch it before reading or after reading. I'm just going to talk about some of the big ideas in the text and maybe you'll find it helpful, maybe not. Uh, totally up to you. So first big idea is that, uh, as I talked about in the introductory lecture to existentialism, it's worth noting how sort of Kantian the picture uh, we get is uh, from de Beauvoir. So she talks about um, humans being ends in themselves, being ends in themselves in ways that uh, are the sort of ultimate source of value for the world. We are ends in ourselves because we are free. We are the source of value in the world because we are free. We are the only source of value in the world because we are free. All of this is exactly what Kant uh, was saying. Kant, I, I would just repeat what I just said and say Kant says that. Uh, she thinks that in virtue of being ends in themselves, uh, you don't want to lie to people. You don't want to uh, betray people. You don't want to kill people, things like this. Uh, she thinks we need to think about our actions in a universal sort of way. And so if that sounds familiar, then it's just, it's Kant. So that I think is uh, hard to overemphasize. Uh, but mostly what I want to talk about is the stuff that's not Kant. Uh, it's the other stuff that de Beauvoir is bringing to the table. So point number two is a big part of this article is taken up with her effectively moral argument against political realism. So she sets up in this article kind of a contest between moral idealism and political realism. It turns out both of these views are wrong. We'll talk about why moral idealism is wrong in section three. Here in section two, what is her issue with political realism? So she's got a lot of sort of different ways of articulating the worry with political realism. So one worry about political realism and political realism is, uh, I don't know, she characterizes it in various ways, but basically it's somebody who sort of thinks they understand how the world works and they have a very realistic sense of how the world works and a very realistic sense of what causes people to do certain things and what causes groups to do certain things and how politics works. And they say, look, I know how to get things done. I know how to sort of practically accomplish things. I'm a very realistic person. I'm going to do whatever it takes to sort of accomplish the correct ends. And so the, maybe the best way of summing up the political realist is uh, the saying, the ends justify the means. So uh, look, they're not going to be held back by silly ideas about uh, like moral right and wrong and stuff like that. Sometimes you have to be immoral, the political realist thinks. So sometimes uh, you have to kill people in order to achieve political ideals. So uh, we can't just be pacifists, the realist thinks. Sometimes you need to fight for something. And certainly you can never avoid things like lying or cheating. Politics is full of lying and cheating. Of course you should betray your ally if this is going to be most expedient. If it's not going to be most expedient, don't betray them. Don't be a jerk for no reason. But the political realist says, look, you just need to do what it takes to accomplish your ends. So um, some sort of famous articulations of political realism are in thinkers like uh, Machiavelli or Cotillia, who uh, suggest that, look, the ends of politics require certain actions. Um, Sun Tzu is another example. So this is the sort of political realist outlook and what is her problem with the political realist. So in various places, she sort of suggests that political realism kind of has a sort of conservative bent. So uh, here at the bottom of 180, she says, uh, that is why when a reform is suggested, the first reaction of the political conservative is always to declare it impossible because he knows that by declaring it impossible, he contribu contributes to making it so. And the thought is that when the conservative wants to get their way, which is to keep things how they are, to stop progress, 
the conservative makes it seem like, look, uh, progress is not something that can be achieved. It's sort of, uh, let's be realistic about things. This is not going to happen. You're asking for too much. And the political realist kind of buys into this kind of thinking. They are deceived by the conservative far too often into thinking change can't be accomplished. So the political realist has a tendency to sort of collapse into conservatism and think, look, utopian projects, great sort of visions about how the world could be, those are just unrealistic. You'll never accomplish that sort of thing. Be more realistic. Be uh, more sensible about what you can achieve. De Beauvoir is not a conservative, and so she doesn't think the conservative viewpoint is right, and so she sort of objects to the idea that we should give in to the conservative tendency to preserve the future, and she thinks the realist is going to give in to this tendency far too often. So that's one kind of objection to the political realist. They're sort of too conservative. A similar objection is that they're sort of uh, excessively cynical. So the reason they buy into the conservative point so often is that the political realist has a very limited imagination about how the world could be. They sort of look at the world as it is and they say, this is, this is the conditions of possibility. So what I see before me sets out the limits of my world. That doesn't mean you can, can't change anything. So some examples of realists she gives are uh, Louis XI or Richelieu who wanted to uh, preserve the Kingdom of France, Emperor Charles, the, Charles V attempting to revive the Holy Roman Empire. These were big changes going on, so unifying France or preserving the kingdom, or preserving maybe not so much, but unifying France or reviving the Holy Roman Empire. These are huge political projects which involve a lot of change. So it's not like the realist is always conservative in the sense of not wanting to change. But the realist is always sort of limited in their views about the future. They sort of start where we are right now, and they think there are limits to what can be accomplished. They are basic, like that's what makes them a realist, if you think about it. So uh, what makes you realist rather than idealist or utopian is that, oh, you're pretty, uh, you're thinking very soberly about uh, the possibilities. You're being realistic about the possibilities. You're not trying to imagine things that are too unrealistic and trying to go after goals which are too unrealistic. And she doesn't like this about the realist. So uh, she says this all over, but... Um, when she's talking about the realist and uh, the utopian project and things like this, um, upon closer examination, the lines separating utopianism from realism are less distinct than they may have appeared at first. In fact, we can prove that squaring the circle and perpetual motion are impossible. But man is not what he is in the way a circle is, whose radii remain invariably equal. He is what he makes himself to be, what he chooses to be. Whatever the given situation, it never necessarily implies one's, one future or another, since man's reaction to his situation is free. How can he decide in advance that peace, war, revolution, justice, happiness, defeat, or victory are impossible? When Lenin was preparing in Switzerland for the coming of a new order, he could have been taken for a great dreamer. And if no one had been so bold as to want the Russian Revolution, if Lenin and all the revolutionaries had thought of themselves as insane, they would indeed have been so, for the revolution would not have happened. So she thinks the political realist is just overly cynical about the, hu the possibilities for humans. You can be cynical about squaring the circle or perpetual motion. You can say those are just impossible. I know those to be impossible because, you know, circles are whatever they are. Physics is whatever it is. But humans are different. Humans are special. The human social world is entirely up to us. There are no limits on humanity. We are ultimately free. Everything that exists when it comes to humans exists because of the actions we take. There is no sort of essence to humanity that we are bound by. Existence precedes essence. All of the choices we make are the only conditions of our reality. And the choices we make are entirely up to us. Nobody can force you to make any given choice. You can make whatever choice you want. And so, the only thing that can make revolution impossible, the Russian revolution impossible, is believing it to be impossible. So if the revolutionaries had thought it was impossible, that would have made it impossible. But they didn't think it was impossible. Lenin had very big dreams. The other revolutionaries had very big dreams. And revolt succeeded in Russia. 
And so the thought is, any human endeavor can succeed if we make it succeed. There is nothing that stops us from achieving anything except us. We can stop ourselves, so she's not saying anything is possible, period. She's saying anything is possible if we do it. And we can stop ourselves and we can stop others from doing things. But it's only us in charge of this. Nothing else is holding us back. It's not like the laws of logic or the laws of physics hold us back. Those bind circles and those bind machines when we're talking about mathematics or physics. But when we're talking about human relations and human endeavors, nothing holds us back. So the political realist is excessively cynical. And in virtue of being excessively cynical, and also perhaps in virtue of being uh, a bit of a conservative, well, maybe not so much the conservative, but um, in virtue of being excessively cynical, and just in general, in virtue of uh, being a realist. Uh, I'll find it soon. Uh, so I think it's here. Um, oh, yeah, so, um, no, we're almost there. Okay, well, whatever. Somewhere somewhere here near the end, uh, she talks about the political realist who uh, says something... Oh, here we go. So, uh, look, the future is nothing but a series of moments that, one after another, each become present, and so are transitory. If the realist placidly prefers the whole over the part, it is because he has adopted a material and quantitative point of view. A thousand men are more than one man, if one looks at man as something countable. But quantity is not value. One thousand francs are more than one franc, if you want to buy objects that are themselves valuable. In a desert, one thousand francs and one centime are equivalent. For a thirsty man, a waterfall is no more than a modest brook. It is a purely mathematical mirage that makes us attach an absolute meaning to the words more and less. If man is finally nothing but himself, then for whom are a thousand men worth more than a single one? The only possible answer is for himself. However, this numerical superiority is not inscribed in reality. It is not a given fact. It still is a subject, it still is subject to a human decision. If, therefore, man declares that in certain cases the sacrifice of one man in, is in his eyes more important than the victory of ten thousand others, he can refuse such a sacrifice. He must choose and decide. The brute fact imposes nothing on him. So the thought is, look, uh, or even earlier, so uh, if human existence were closed in on itself, it would be no more than a vegetative state. This is why we readily accept the sacrifice of individuals to the community, or of a living generation to men who are not yet born. I can lie to some men today so that all men may someday know the truth. I can have some men killed, a million is insignificant for the price of the infinite, if it will bring lasting peace to the world. This is how the realist justifies himself. So the realist says, look, it's okay to kill one person to save a thousand. It's okay to kill a thousand to save a million. It's okay to kill a million to save sort of the infinite amount of humanity in the future if it's going to bring lasting peace to the world. We can sacrifice any number of people, according to the realist. Morality doesn't hold us back. We just, the ends justify the means. If you can achieve a very good end by killing some people or by lying, uh, you can lie to some people, and it's for the sake of the truth in the future. Great, go ahead, says the realist. And so this is amorality, as I've described it uh, up here. So it's saying, look, forget about morality. You just need to do whatever achieves sort of your goals. And she thinks this amorality is a slide towards immorality, because look, who says one life is worth less than a thousand lives? That works for something like money if you're in the context of buying things. But of course, money is only worth something in certain contexts. In other contexts, it's not worth anything. The only thing that's of absolute worth is 
humans. And so the only thing that can ever make uh, somebody worth nothing uh, but himself, or uh, the only thing that can make a thousand people worth more than a single person is our choices. The only way you can sort of say that, you know, it's worth sacrificing one to save a thousand is by making that your truth. That is your choice. That is a decision you are making, but that is on you. It's not sort of out there in the world already. It's not like the realist can say, of course, one is less than a thousand or something. Uh, this numerical superiority is not inscribed in reality. It's not a given fact. It's still subject to human decision. So look, it's on us to decide how to do this and how should we decide to do this? So this is when we go back to the Kantianism. So she says, look, humans are ends in themselves. Uh, we shouldn't be lying to people. We shouldn't be killing people. And so the amorality of the realist slides into immorality when it just makes them very happy almost to sacrifice people for the sake of the whole or to lie to people uh, for the sake of some good end. And de Beaufort is not happy about this. And so all three of these things, the conservatism, the excessive cynicism, and the amorality, which sort of slides into immorality, these are all just reflections of the realist's central mistake, which is missing the central existentialist point, which is existence precedes essence. There is nothing out there in reality that tells you how to act. You have to decide entirely how to act based on freedom, and the consequence of this is effectively Kantian morality. Because humans are ultimately free, because we're ultimate ends in ourselves, you must never treat somebody merely as a means, and so you can't go around lying to people and killing and so on and so forth. So, so much for her argument against political realism. So you think, great, she's a moral idealist. But the answer is no, she doesn't think moral idealism is correct either. And so why not? Well, after she said you can't lie to people, you can't treat them as means, you must treat them as ends in themselves, then she points out, uh, look, the moralist who wants, to both, who wants both to act and to approve of himself would want to use only means that are in themselves ethical. That is to say, only those whose meaning is in keeping with the end he is aiming for. So, you know, you want to follow morality. However, this dream is impossible. And if he insists, he will only vacillate between heaven and earth without being able to truly engage himself in this world. To come down to earth means accepting defilement, failure, horror. It means admitting that it is impossible to save everything. And what is lost is lost forever. So she says, you must treat everybody as an end in themselves and not lie and so on and not kill. But you can't. It is impossible. It is impossible to save everything. We have to accept defilement, failure, and horror. You will always be immoral. What is lost is lost forever. You can't be perfect. You can't be ideal. So the moral idealist is wrong in aiming to be ideal. There are other issues with moral idealism, but, you know, those are in the beginning of the article. The main issue with moral idealism is that it's impossible. It's just impossible. You cannot always do the right thing because there are moral conflicts. The earth is full of defilement, failure, and horror. So we have our morality all set out for us, but we can't be moral, <laughs> or you can't be perfectly moral. And so you might think, oh, well, so, you know, forget it, forget morality. Does this mean we must finally return to justifying any means for the sake of the end? No, she says. No, you can't just forget morality merely because it's impossible. We need to understand that end and means form an indivisible totality. The end is defined by the means, which receive their meaning from it. An action is a signifying ensemble that unfolds across the world, across time, and whose unity cannot be broken. It is a singular totality that we must construct and choose at every instant. It is for us to decide whether one man must be killed in order to save ten, or to let ten die so as not to betray one. The decision is inscribed neither in earth nor on heaven. Whatever I may choose to do, I will be unfaithful to my profound desire to respect human life. And yet I am forced to choose. No reality exterior to myself can direct me in my choice. So you can't just give up morality because there is nothing else to guide you. You are guiding you. If you think you aren't, if you think you aren't making these choices, you are living in bad faith. These are your choices. 
The choice comes to you. It is entirely on you. Nothing else dictates what happens except you. So that means the responsibility is on you and you must make a choice. So you can't sort of outsource the choice uh, to the end that you're trying to achieve or something and just say, look, I'm just trying to achieve this good thing. Uh, and so I'm doing whatever it takes to do that. No, the choice is on you. It's for you to decide. Nothing can make the decision for you. And so you cannot ignore morality because this applies to you. It applies to everybody. So what do we do about this? I mean, <laughs> there's, there's nothing you can't do except, except, except. So uh, except with an E, except with an A. You must accept uh, the fact that coming down to earth means accepting defilement, failure, and horror. So that is life. But that doesn't mean anything goes. It means it's up to you. So, uh, good luck. <laughs>